Trabalhamos diariamente para criar soluções e equipamentos para a comunidade científica, contribuindo com o avanço da pesquisa biomédica latino-americana. Nossa missão é maior do que somente fornecer equipamentos. É proporcionar segurança com atendimento de qualidade e, principalmente, com muito respeito e atenção. Por isso, investimos em alta tecnologia e buscamos manter relacionamentos duradouros. Nosso compromisso é ser um parceiro confiável, que compreenda as necessidades, a realidade e as condições de cada cliente para, assim, oferecer a melhor solução sempre. Entendemos os benefícios da pesquisa científica para a humanidade e isso nos estimula. Se hoje temos melhor qualidade de vida, maior longevidade, se vencemos um câncer ou fazemos uso de um remédio para dor de cabeça, é porque o avanço da pesquisa biomédica nos permite. Confiamos no trabalho dos pesquisadores, na ciência e na comunidade científica. E nos orgulhamos em fazer a nossa parte. Assim como você, somos apaixonados. Ciência é o que nos move, porque para Alesco, pesquisa é para a vida.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our last presentation from our webinar. Uh, our last speaker is Professor Matt Parker. Uh, Professor Parker is a behavioral neuroscientist and psychopharmacologist. He was educated at the University of Southampton and following postdocs at the Royal Veterinary College and Queen Mary University of London and a faculty position in cell biology at Queen Mary. He joined the University of Portsmouth, establishing the Brain and Behavior Lab in 2015. He leads a team that studies the biology of neuropsychiatric, neurodevelopmental, and neurodegenerative disorders, primarily using zebrafish as a model organism. He has published nearly 100 peer-reviewed articles, chapters, and scholarly reviews, and receives funding currently totaling over 3 million pounds. This Friday, our last day's event counts on with Professor Parker, who will present some of his findings and interesting discussions about neuroscience. So don't hesitate to participate. Thank you, Professor, for accepting our invitation. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for coming to listen. So what I'm going to talk about over the next three quarters of an hour or so is some of the work that we've been doing in my lab primarily looking at memory and memory processes using zebrafish. We've been studying various aspects of zebrafish behavior um, in my lab and previously when I worked at Queen Mary. Um, and really what we've been trying to do is to understand better about how we can use zebrafish to their kind of full extent in order to be a useful translational model in neuroscience. There are several considerations that we have when we're trying to decide how best to use zebrafish. And of course, one of those considerations that we all need to really think about is to what extent can we extrapolate from the zebrafish behavior in order to understand more about human behavior. So really what I want you to think about when I'm talking today is the extent to which we can use these data and use what zebrafish will be most suited for in terms of understanding about human behavior. So I'll try to make it clear about how we translate the findings from the zebrafish into humans throughout the talk. So really what motivated us to try to understand more about memory in zebrafish is aging related cognitive decline. So we know that, you know, everybody is living longer now across the world. Uh, in fact, one in 11 people in the world are now over the age of 65. So that's around 9% of the population. Now, this is going to rise uh, to around one in six. It's predicted by the year 2050. Um, and in particular, in, in Europe and in the USA, there are some predictions that this could rise as high as a quarter of people being over the age of 65. Now, although that's great from a, a, a kind of a longevity perspective, there are differences in the aging process into individual processes that we know are affected during the normal healthy aging process. So one of those things, for example, is cognitive decline and especially memory. So as people get older, their memory will start to decline. And again, it's part of the normal healthy aging process. So we, we expect this to happen, but the better we understand it in terms of the underlying biology, the kind of neural mechanisms that underlie the normal healthy aging process, and in particular how that impacts on memory, then the better position we'll be in to try to ensure that people grow older in a more healthy way and are able to live their lives to the full extent of what that longevity will give them. Now, obviously, this uh, seminar, this webinar is about zebrafish, and I'm sure that most of the people that are listening to me at the moment will be familiar with zebrafish. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over all the positive, uh, the, the positive aspects of using zebrafish as a model system. Um, 
some of the most important aspects are obviously the genome is fully sequenced. Um, we know that zebrafish have very high fecundity rates, so they, they lay a lot of eggs in a relatively short period of time, allowing us to uh, carry out kind of high throughput research and, um, and, and quickly move through generations for looking at um, impacts of genetic alterations and so on. Um, zebrafish are relatively low cost. You know, one of the reasons I think uh, people use zebrafish a lot is because comparatively speaking, it's a lot cheaper to use zebrafish in, uh, in an experimental context than it is, for example, to use rodents. Obviously, there are vertebrates, so we can extrapolate from those vertebrate to other vertebrates, such as humans and mammals. So they have the same kind of underlying setup of the, uh, of the nervous system. They have a relatively fast life cycle, so um, they re rarely live beyond three or four years if they're extremely old, but we, we can breed from them successfully from around two to three months old, depending on how well fed they are. And one of the really critical things with zebrafish that makes them such an attractive model system, especially to those interested in, um, in, in genomics and genetics research, is that they're robust to uh, genetic mutations. So um, zebrafish, typically, even if you introduce fairly um, severe mutations that are associated with human disease, for example, um, even in those mutations where they're homozygous lethal after a few days, um, you're able to use the larvae to understand in a living organism um, the, the mechanisms potentially associated with that gene's function. So there's lots of reasons why zebrafish are an excellent model system. Um, one thing that's not on there, which is obviously uh, something that I'm particularly interested in, uh, is the fact that their behavior is inherently measurable and understandable in a quantitative sense. And this is something that's really been developing over the past um, decade or two, really. OK, so um, I want to introduce you now to the task that I'm predominantly going to be talking about today. Um, we wanted to come up with a task of memory that was not only able to allow us to measure memory in, in zebrafish, but it was also able to do it in a way that did not involve too much human interaction. You know, zebrafish, they don't respond particularly well to lots of handling if you're having to you know pull them out of the water with a net and so on um, also if you're trying to use for example food reinforcement and food reward in the context of training um, you know they don't eat a lot <laughs> they're very small animals so um, there's only so many uh, reinforced trials you can do with a zebrafish. Um, other ways of measuring memory, for example, delivery of electric shocks and, and kind of uh, fear conditioning and so on, obviously that's quite invasive and um, can result in the animals showing uh, adverse behavioral consequences. So really, given what other tasks were available, we wanted to try to come up with a task that was non-invasive, but was also able to allow us to test the zebrafish in a kind of, uh, in a naturalistic way, if you like. Now, the first thing that we thought about was uh, some kind of version of the Y maze. Now, many of you will be uh, familiar with the Y maze. It's a, a maze like you can see on the screen here. And the rodent version of this has three arms. Um, there'll be equal angles between them. Um, and essentially, you place the rodent in one of the arms and you look at it over three different choices, essentially. Um, and what we're looking for in a, a sort of typical spontaneous alternation task is whether the rodent chooses a novel arm, so an arm that it hasn't visited in the previous uh, trial, or whether it chooses the same arm that it went into before. And essentially, within that context, uh, alternations are known as when the animal goes into a novel environment and repetition is when they just go back into the same arm again. So um, if it was choosing, for example, that route, then that would be um, an alternation because it would be going uh, into the new arm each time. Now, we were interested in not just looking at the zebrafish over three trials. We wanted to know what would happen if we placed them in this environment uh, over a prolonged period of time. And in particular, what would happen if we examined 
the choices of each entry as if it was a two choice discrimination. So if you imagine the way the Y maze is constructed, so imagine here in, in picture C, for example, you are where the zebrafish currently is. So you can see a small uh, white cross on the screen there in the top image. Uh, so imagine you were that zebrafish and you were in this arm. If you swam up to the end of this arm, you would have uh, two choices. You could either turn right uh, or you could turn left. Those are your two choices. Uh, you could go back, but assume that you can make two choices left or right. Uh, similarly, if the zebrafish is in this arm, uh, it can make two choices left or right. And similarly, this one, it can make two choices left or right. So instead of looking at the novel arm, so the arm that the fish is currently in, we looked at it in terms of whether the animal makes a choice to go left or right. And we wanted to look at this over a long period of time to see whether those left and right alternations, so left, right, left, right, um, what kinds of patterns we start to see. So were the animals more uh, habitual? Did they tend to do the same thing over and over again? Um, or were they quite random in their search choice? So that was the initial thing we wanted to test. Um, I should mention at this point that we did all our behavioral work, um, as we always do, uh, in the uh, Xantix AD unit. So Xantix is a company uh, based in the UK, in Cambridge in the UK, that makes uh, automated behavioral equipment for uh, doing all kinds of different tests with zebrafish, including the y -Mates. So um, what I want to show you is essentially the kind of data that we get from this. And I'll explain this in more detail in a moment. Now, the way we organize our data is in these left, right, left, right turns. So you can see um, a, a, a data set at the bottom here. Um, so this is left, left, right, left, right, and so on. Um, now, the way we organize this is by looking at um, each sequence of four turns. So the first sequence of four is left, left, right, left. Uh, the second sequence of four is left, right, left, right. The third is right, left, right, left. And the fourth is uh, left, right, left, right, and so on. Now, the reason we do this is because when you look at those series of turns, um, when you look at them over a long period of time, those what we call tetragrams, so those series of four turn choices, uh, can be organized across 16 different categories. So they can either be left, 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 right, left, left, right, left, and so on, all the way through to right, 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 right. And there's 16 different choices in that. Now, the reason we use this is because when an animal is making choices, two choice discriminations, it follows an approximately, if it, if it was random, it would follow an approximately uh, random distribution. But when we look at it over a series of four choices, it allowed us to plot it in a Bayesian sense that allowed us to build a Markovian model um, that allowed us then to look at randomness versus non-randomness. So for various mathematical reasons, it makes more sense uh, to include series of four turns than to use a series of two or three. Now, what we see when we look at the animal's responses within this scenario is something like this. So if you watch the video, uh, so the animal turns right and then right again and then right again. So this is what we would call uh, repetitions. So the animal goes right, 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 right. Now, alternations, the animal goes left, and then it goes right, and then it goes left, and then it goes right. So that's what we would call an alternation. So we essentially have two different scenarios where the animals could go uh, pure repetition, so they just keep turning left or they keep turning right, uh, or pure alternations where they go left, right, left, right. Now, when we have a look at these data, um, so these data are published in a paper uh, from last year in uh, Behavioral Research Methods. The first author was uh, one of my old graduate students, Madeline Cleal, who has now left our group. Um, now, when we look at the series of turns, so if you look here, uh, this is uh, a, uh, a histogram essentially showing you the uh, the number of uh, the frequency of turns or of each of these tetragrams within a, a one hour period. So what you'll notice is that most of the turns are uh, approximately 
what you would expect if it was random. So most of the tetragrams are random. But these two particular turn choices, so uh, left, right, left, right, and right, left, right, left, which is, as I explained before, uh, spontaneous alternations, so alternating between the two choices, uh, these are uh, much higher than average. So in, in fact, um, if you were expecting them to be at chance, they'd be at around 6.5. But actually, we typically see these at around uh, somewhere between 10 and 20 uh, percent of the time they will carry out these alternations. So when you add the, the two together, the two types of alternations, you often get between 20 and 40% uh, percent of the time they're doing these alternations. Now, this is overall. So uh, again, here the error bars are across many animals and overall across all of the different choices. Now, if you look at the second graph at the bottom here, these uh, each of these lines for each tetragram represent a 10-minute time bin. So what we see, if you notice here across time, is that again, for most of the uh, for most of the tetragrams, you don't see any particular change over time. But for the alternations, you see this very uh, idiosyncratic change over time. So essentially, they start quite low, always above average, but but quite low, and then they move up and up and up, and then they peak. Um, at around 40 minutes, and then it starts to reduce again. So what you see is not only an increase in the number of alternations across the entire one hour period, you also see uh, individuals change their search strategy as a function of time during that one hour period. So there are two specific dependent variables that we can measure in that context. One of them is change over time, and one of them is the proportion of alternations that the animals carry out. So now we know what those patterns of search are within the Y maze. The next thing we wanted to know is, you know, assuming that, um, you know, these are indicative of some kind of pattern, there are two things that we're likely to be seeing. The first thing is it's probably something to do with memory. If an animal is performing a, a particular a, a type of, of, of movement, for example, left, right, left, right, it has to be forming some kind of memory trace in order to know that last time it turned left. Therefore, this time it has to turn right. So there must be some kind of memory involved. OK, that's the first thing that we that we hypothesized. The second thing that we hypothesized was that if the animal is changing its search pattern over time, that is likely to indicate some kind of behavioral flexibility. So some kind of change of strategy over the course of the one hour. So what we wanted to understand is a is that what we were seeing? And B, what neural circuits underlie that? So if we, you know, if we are seeing memory and flexibility, as seems clear from the data, um, what are the kind of underlying neural processes? Um, so we looked at this uh, again in that same paper that I mentioned before. Um, so we looked at uh, the, the uh, working memory first. So if you look at the graphs here, you'll see um, a variety of different drugs that will potentially alter memory. And so on the y axis of all of these graphs is the alternations that I mentioned before. So the left, right, left, right, and so on. Um, and on the x axis are the doses of or the concentrations of particular drugs we looked at. Um, so we looked at uh, MK801, uh, which obviously blocks uh, glutamate. We looked at scopolamine. Um, which works on muscarinic receptors. Uh, we looked at SCH23390, uh, which works on dopamine D1 receptors uh, as, an as an antagonist, I should say, and sulpiride, which is uh, D2-like receptors. Now, what you'll notice is that um, the uh, MK801, which again, we know blocks long-term potentiation, um, so we saw a, a dose dependent reduction in alternations from MK801 and scopolamine and the SCH23390, um, all of which suggested that not only was uh, the uh, alternation patterns relating to working memory, but also three drugs that, uh, that we know affect working memory from various different neural circuits all uh, reduce the alternations within, um, within the zebrafish over that time. Uh, the sulpiride, which is a D2 receptor antagonist, didn't have any impact on it, but that'll become quite important in a little while. So keep that in your mind. Um, so the second thing we did, this was a paper we published uh, earlier this year in psychopharmacology, was to look more at um, both alternations, uh, but also uh, behavioral flexibility. So again, these changes in behavior over time. So um, what we found was that we, we looked at uh, the administration of dopamine agonists, so amphetamine, which obviously is a mainly D2, but a sort of non-specific uh, dopamine agonist, uh, but also a um, noradrenergic uh, reuptake inhibitor as well. So it increases dopamine and noradrenaline uh, in the brain. Uh, we also looked at nicotine, which obviously is a cholinergic um, agonist. Uh, 
So we were looking at uh, increases over both a chronic and acute uh, uh, administrations um, of dopamine agonists, uh, but also cholinergic agonists to see how this impacted on both um, alternations. Uh, so in terms of memory, uh, but also in terms of behavioral flexibility. And what we found was that actually uh, amphetamine increases uh, the alternations, which we think was probably so it does this uh, chronically and um, acutely. And we think that this is probably to do with the fact that amphetamine boosts attention. So when you increase the dopamine, uh, you get an increase in attention and probably uh, an increase in that short term memory. Uh, which then improves performance. Um, similarly, nicotine, um, after acute challenge, so after the animals have been primed with nicotine, uh, we saw increases in their memory for, uh, uh, in terms of the y maze, uh, in terms of the alternations in the y maze, uh, in a similar way to amphetamine. On the right hand side of the screen, you can see our data for the behavioral flexibility. Now, interestingly, um, the uh, control animals, uh, they showed uh, an increase in uh, performance over time. So uh, this, this graph demonstrates the change in their uh, the change in their um, uh, alternations as a function of time during the task. Um, similarly, we saw that in nicotine. So regardless of the whether it was chronic or acute and so on, uh, we saw increases over time. Interestingly, with the amphetamine, when we gave the animals amphetamine, it actually abolished that behavioral flexibility. Now, what that tells us is that the amphetamine might be improving attention and might be improving the memory in that, but actually it is impacting on performance. So it's changing that behavioral flexibility somehow. And that's actually what we might expect to see is that if you give amphetamine, for example, during um, uh, reversal learning tasks, it can impact on performance because although it might increase uh, some aspects of performance like attention, it can disrupt that kind of uh, behavioral flexibility within that context. We also were interested in the impact of environmental challenge because we know, for example, that if the um, if amphetamine, oh, sorry, if amphetamine, if uh, animals are stressed, uh, you know, within their environment, this can impact on their memory, uh, but can also, for example, in terms of uh, their responses to two choice discriminations, it can increase repetitive behaviours, like abnormal repetitive behaviours. And this is something that's quite common in psychiatry research, for example, looking at things like schizophrenia, um, autism, where they're looking at abnormal repetitive behaviours, and even addiction and so on. We know that stress is quite a powerful mediator of that uh, repetitive behavior. So we were quite interested in the impacts of stress on uh, performance within the wine maze. So if you notice, um, we, uh, we we did various different ways of looking at this. Um, firstly, we look at alternations. So the left, right, left, right. And what you'll see, so this is a, a, a graph showing the change in alternations over time, so behavioral flexibility. Um, what we find is that when you stress the animals out, this impacts on their uh, alternations. So you'll see here a reduction in alternations following um, a, a, an environmental stressor. Um, and that is actually rescued, interestingly, by a dopamine D15 receptor um, uh, agonist. So it, it's uh, uh, quite clear that stress impacts on behavioral flexibility, but that is rescued um, if, you, if you give a D1, D5 um, agonist. Uh, we also found, and this is the first time that we've really thought about repetitions in this context, we also found that, that acute stress increased the number of repetitions. So if you remember when we were looking at the maze, we have alternations, which is left, right, left, right. But we also had repetitions, which is where the animals continue to make the same repetitive choice, left, 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 or right, 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 right. And again, what was interesting about this is that that um, increase in repetitions uh, that was caused by stress, when we also gave the animals a dopamine D1, D5 agonist, uh, that actually uh, abolished that effect. So it made those animals return to uh, what you would expect without stress. So it seems that there is a rescue effect of the dopamine D1, D5 receptor agonist. Um, we looked at what might be mediating this, whether it might be to do with changes in you know, behavioral profile or whether it was to do with stress. And in fact, we found that the, uh, the cortisol um, was obviously increased by the stressor. But again, this was rescued by the uh, dopamine D1 agonist. So it seems like that dopamine D1, D5 receptor agonist um, was uh, in some way reducing that stress response. And again, we can see this through the cortisol, we can see it through the changes in behavioural flexibility, and we can see it through the number of repetitions that the animals were doing in the Y maze.
So now we know a little bit about the underlying biology and the neural circuits that might be involved with uh, zebrafish in terms of their performance within the Y maze, both in terms of the alternations, but also the repetitions. We also wanted to know whether we see similar kinds of patterns in this Y maze in other vertebrates. You know, I, I said at the beginning of the talk, it's not really much use if it's only zebrafish that show these patterns. So in the next phase, we wanted to see whether these patterns in the Y maze were conserved in other animals. So you'll see on the left um, a, a picture of zebrafish swimming around in the maze. Um, and you can see the kind of uh, left, right, left, right, the kind of exploration that they're doing within the maze. Um, and again, we filmed them for an hour doing this. Um, but we also had a maze built uh, for mice. So you can see this is a, a, a black six mouse. And you can see that when you place the mouse into the Y maze for an hour, um, it similarly searches around. And so, um, again, we filmed a number of different mice in there for an hour, obviously without water. Uh, the mice were just uh, crawling around. Um, I should mention, actually, at this point that there's no um, there's no light in the maze. We have it at very low lux levels. And we do this because we don't want any extra maze cues. We want all the cues to be um, whatever the internal cues are. So it may be scent. Um, it, it may be whatever, you know, physical touch, whatever the animal has, but we don't have any light in there so that they can't use cues to navigate around. OK, um, so this is the uh, the tetragrams that you see here. So this is the, the results that you see. So this is the zebrafish that you've already seen before. Um, and this is the mice. And so um, as you can see, the, the performance uh, over that one hour period for mice and zebrafish is, 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 is identical, essentially. The only slight difference that you see with the uh, zebrafish, and this is something that we haven't really touched on yet, but we'll touch on a bit more later, is that in zebrafish, you tend to see more animals with the repetitions. So um, this does uh, sometimes go beyond chance, the repetitions. The alternations are always, always above chance, uh, but sometimes repetitions will be above chance. It tends to be very driven by particular individuals. So um, you don't see this so much in mice, uh, but with zebrafish, you do see this uh, increase in, in repetitions in some so uh, the next thing we wanted to do was said, well, OK, if we see it in uh, fish and we see it in uh, mice, do we also see it in humans? So working with some colleagues at the University of Southampton, we came up with something called a honeycomb maze. Um, the honeycomb maze that we use is a lot larger than this. If you imagine this on a much, much, much larger scale, um, we put the people in a in a virtual start box. This is all virtual. It was all done online, but uh, we didn't actually put them in the maze. Um, and we got them to travel around only for five minutes. Um, and if you watch the video at the bottom, you'll see what it looks like. Um, this is slightly sped up. Um, so the person travels around in here and um, you'll see it has a um, he or she has a series of Y's um, and left, right, left, right choices to make uh, during the navigation. And they never get out. They just keep going round and round and round um, and uh, they search around and then the trial finishes. And again, what we can do with the human data similar to what we've done with the zebrafish and the mice, is that we can look at their uh, search patterns within that maze to see whether they are uh, using any particular search strategies. So uh, drum roll, what do you think we found? Uh, well, this is the data from the humans. So uh, we've repeated this a number of different times with different cohorts of humans. And uh, you'll notice that the, uh, the data from the humans is identical to the zebrafish and to the mice. Um, so, again, with, with all vertebrate species that we've tested so far, we have seen very similar patterns of alternations. Um, we are potentially looking at other species as well. So if anybody is interested in testing other species in this, if they have a suitable Y-shaped maze, uh, I'm always happy to chat about it. But so far, um, every species that we've, we've looked at will show these, uh, these alternations as a kind of natural uh, part of behaviour. So um, as a, a kind of interim summary before we move on, uh, the Y maze, we call it the FMP Y maze, which is the free movement pattern Y maze, because it's different from the sort of normal Y mazes in the sense that the animals are freely allowed to move around. So uh, it appears to be useful for studying working memory because using drugs that we know impact working memory also block performance. Uh, we know that uh, in the fish, certainly, and we have no reason to think it would be different in other species, uh, the memory within the maze is controlled by glutamate, acetylcholine and dopamine. Um, 
it seems likely based on our data so far that it's related to DRD1 like rather than DRD2 like uh, receptors, um, especially in the sense uh, of memory, because um, again, you know, amphetamine increases performance in the maze, it, it damages. Uh, it damages the, the behavioral flexibility, but it does actually improve performance. Um, so, <clears throat> and that's likely to be more to do with the attentional mechanisms rather than the memory. So we think that probably DRD1 like are more likely to be uh, involved with this, which would fit with what we know about working memory. So it would kind of make sense. Um, and behavioral flexibility is also uh, potentially controlled by um, uh, dopamine, but we don't know really it could be DRD1 and DRD2 like and, and various other processes. Um, we know that vertebrates, including humans, of course, show comparable search patterns in the maze, which obviously uh, suggest uh, translational relevance of the task and therefore make it useful for a variety of different translational questions that we might have uh, regarding memory. OK, so um, the next phase of our work has been trying to understand more about the Y maze in terms of not only the the impact of, for example, things like development on the Y maze. I mean, I talked at the beginning of the talk there about um, about aging related cognitive decline. So what happens in terms of ontogeny? What happens to the fish over the lifespan? Um, there are various reasons why we might be interested in looking at this. For example, um, if, for example, larvae would show memory uh, you know, memory traces within the Y maze, it may then be useful for sort of high throughput screening. Um, also, if, if aging is shown to impact on Y maze performance, then it could be useful for using uh, zebrafish for models of aging in humans. So looking at the ontogeny, the sort of lifespan development um, of the animals in terms of their Y maze performance seemed like an important um, initial question. So this is a graph. Uh, these these are unpublished data at the moment, but um, this is a, a series of we're, we're adding to some aspects of it. So it will be published in due course. Um, this is a series of data from animals from the age of four days post fertilization um, all the way up to 24 months post fertilization. So the oldest we used was 24 months olds and the youngest was four day olds. Um, we used four day olds because although there is obviously everyone who works with zebrafish who's listening to me now will say, why on earth did you use four day olds? They don't do anything. Um, we, we specifically wanted to look at them because um, in Europe, certainly, uh, there are um, fewer kind of ethical issues associated with using four day old larvae. So um, it has a lot of benefits, for example, for industry, for, for drug development and so on, if the animals are not protected by law. So under the age of four days, uh, under the age of five days, so four days and, and lower, they're not protected by our animal welfare laws. Um, so essentially you can use them for um, for, for, for research without having to have a license. So they can be attractive to some people that don't have licenses. Uh, so we thought it was important to look at them. Um, we then looked at seven day old, 14, one month, three months, six months, 12 months and 24 months to look at the kind of lifespan perspective. Um, so the first thing is uh, the four day old guys uh, were, were not very good. There were some problems. Um, they don't really move very much. Um, I mentioned that we're, 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 we're working on that. We're trying to find ways of trying to encourage them to move a bit more, for example, using vibration and light and so on. Um, so that's a work in progress, hence why we haven't published any of this yet. But um, it is something that we think potentially might be useful. So we'll carry on working with it. So what you see very clearly is that this alternation strategy starts to appear at seven days old. And in fact, um, you get a little spike at 14 days old and then uh, it follows a kind of linear trend. Um, this is in terms of alternations uh, up to uh, six months post fertilization. And then it gradually starts to decline thereafter. It doesn't decline significantly, statistically speaking, until 24 months. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, but what you see is um, a clear increase uh, through the uh, through the sort of uh, uh, juvenile period up to adulthood and then a decrease um, through kind of um, young adulthood, middle age, if you like, and then older age. Uh, similarly, you see increases in repetition. So again, it increases up to uh, three months or so, but then it kind of balances out, which it kind of fits with what we see um, in the animals anyway, because repetitions, although, as I mentioned before, are slightly higher than others, they tend not to be particularly um, uh, changing over time and that kind of thing excuse me take a drink before i lose my voice okay um so this is the sort of lifespan development now you may have noticed in that last graph that i was 
talking particularly about the 24 month old uh, fish. So um, we published a paper earlier this year in the Neurobiology of Aging, where we looked in detail about what happens to these older fish. So um, in terms of cognitive decline, um, once we saw those data, we wanted to look at it in more detail. So we looked specifically at the difference between uh, sort of young adults, six months and 24 month old um, uh, zebrafish to have a look at how that impacted. So you can see from this graph quite clearly that it's six months post fertilization. You get this kind of peak uh, performance of um, alternations. But actually, by the time you get to 24 months, although it is still slightly higher than you, what you would expect, um, it does decrease significantly uh, from the performance that you see at six months, suggesting cognitive decline. Um, so what we looked at was uh, we looked at uh, what happens in zebrafish and we actually uh, compared this to older humans. So uh, if you look at this graph here, this is the zebrafish on the left. Um, and this is the, uh, sorry, no, these, these are both uh, humans, I beg your pardon. The zebrafish is on this slide. So that was the data from the zebrafish. Uh, and this is the data from the humans. Um, so this is uh, people that were over the age of 70 years old. Uh, which is old, and the young adults, which were 18 to 30 year olds. And as you can see, there was no difference in the uh, repetitions, uh, but there was a significant reduction in alternations in the older adults. So similar to what we saw uh, before in terms of translation, uh, not only do we see that the humans show similar kinds of responses within our virtual YMAs, we also see that you get similar kinds of aging related cognitive decline in our version of the Y maze in the humans as you get in the fish. And again, this was published earlier this year in the Neurobiology of Aging. We wanted to understand a little bit more about what the processes were that under uh, were underlying this difference. And so what we looked at, apologies for the quality of the graphs here, they didn't copy on very well. Um, we wanted to look at uh, potentially what happens if we give these animals a cognitive enhancing drug. So we know, for example, that um, the DRD1 uh, uh, like family of uh, agonists, so things like modafinil um, have been shown in the past to have uh, cognitive enhancing effects. Um, so we had a look at what the impact of giving a DRD1 uh, like DRD15 agonist uh, to the older fish would be. And as you can see from this, uh, the DRD15 agonist rescues the, um, the decline. So cognitive decline in old age seems to be under the influence of the DRD1-like receptors. In order to look into this in more detail, we had a look, we did some uh, qPCRs on the um, brain of the zebrafish to have a look at um, changes within the DRD1 and DRD5, uh, but also generally like the dopamine transporter mechanisms. Um, what we saw was no difference in dopamine uh, transporter. Uh, this is aging related difference and no difference in DRD1. But we did see a uh, an increase in the, uh, in the sort of fold change of um, of the DRD5. This suggested that um, there was some sort of uh, synaptic modifications going on during aging and that this DRD5 might be some sort of uh, sort of compensation effect, for example, um, that's seen as part of the aging process owing to a reduction potentially in the D1, D5 like receptors. Um, we also looked at what happens to the receptor or to, to gene expression within these receptors uh, when you had given the treatment. So when you gave the uh, DRD1 like receptor. And interestingly, what we saw was that um, in the so we didn't see any difference in any of the uh, DRD1, uh, 2 or 5 genes or even in tyrosine hydroxylase. So uh, in terms of actual dopamine production. But what we did see, interestingly, was that when you give the D1 receptor uh, asked to six month old fish, you see a down regulation of DAT. But this is then abolished in the 24 month old. So the fact that you see no difference in DAT when you give them the drug, but you do see that increase in D5 suggests that there are some potentially uh, synaptic modifications, aging related synaptic modifications, specifically around the DRD5 gene um, that might have uh, an impact on that cognitive process. So by using that um, aging related cognitive decline, it's given us some uh, insights potentially into some of the mechanisms that might underlie um, aging related differences uh, in, in cognition in, in, in older humans as well. So um, one thing that we haven't talked about yet, and I think was another interesting uh, issue that we, we thought might be useful for the Y maze is can we use performance on the Y maze uh, 
to understand any other aspects of behavior. So can we use it as a kind of behavioral phenotyping tool, if you like? Um, so this was work uh, done by uh, Barbara Fontana, who's one of my fantastic PhD students, who sadly will be leaving me soon because she's finished her PhD, um, but uh, uh, she'll be very missed in our lab. She's a great student and very productive. Um, so Barbara um, has done a lot of work using the YMAs. And this is from a paper that we wrote last year in Animal Cognition. Um, now, one of the things that 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 kind of struck us very early on with this was that, look, you know, we know that zebrafish may be useful for looking at laterality. There's been huge amounts of really great work looking at uh, laterality bias. So preference for, for left or right. Um, uh, in, in this species. And we know that, you know, laterality can be linked to a lot of different processes. So memory and cognition, stress reactivity, anxiety, depression, and so on. So what we did, uh, or what Barbara did, was she screened a huge number of uh, fish, so many, many, many fish, um, in the Y maze, and we quantified their laterality bias. So we looked at animals that showed more than 60% preference for either left or right, um, they were uh, classified as uh, having a laterality bias and animals that showed um, no particular preference. So less than 60 percent um, were classified as non-biased. OK, and if you look at this uh, picture here, you'll notice that around 45 and a half percent or so. Um, so nearly half of them uh, don't really show any bias, uh, but around um, a quarter, so around 27 percent. Um, are, are left bias and around 27% are right bias. So we have um, quite a nice e e even distribution between whether they are left or right bias, uh, but, but the majority, uh, nearly half, uh, show non-bias. So then what we did was we um, looked at various different patterns within the Y maze um, to see how the, uh, you know, how the, the laterality bias impacts their behaviour. So the first thing that we saw was uh, there was a little bit of difference. So the right bias one so it showed slightly fewer turns. What we found, interestingly, was that uh, in terms of repetitions, uh, the, the biased animals were more likely to show repetitions. Now, bear in mind, you might think, well, that's obvious, isn't it? If they show more left bias, don't forget these animals are showing about a thousand turns. <laughs> Um, over the course of an hour. And this is only 20% of the tetragrams. So it's not like the animals are just turning left, left, left the entire time or right, right, right. It just means that, you know, on average, they are moving around randomly most of the time. But in 20% of those trials, they are showing either repetitions or alternations. Sometimes that can be hard to get your head around. But it's worth remembering that we're not saying that they just turn left all the time. It's just at a higher proportion of the time than the uh, than the, than the non biased guys. Okay, so in terms of repetitions, the left biased guys um, were more likely to carry out repetitions, as were the right bias. They also, um, both groups, left and right bias, also showed fewer alternations. And if you look at this um, graph at the bottom, you can see that the left biased ones were more likely to show left, left, left bias. Uh, and the uh, right ones were more likely to show right, right, right bias, which is kind of unsurprising. But, but again, it's 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 useful to note how much of a difference that is in terms of those pure alternations. So the second thing we wanted to know was how does this impact on other behaviour? So what we did was we looked at um, Pavlovian fear conditioning. And in Pavlovian fear conditioning, essentially what you do is you train the animals um, over a series of trials um, that a particular visual stimulus in their tank is associated with a, a mild electric shock. And what happens is that if you look at this graph um, uh, during the baseline, they show a preference either for their uh, condition stimulus, which you, we use a, a check uh, pattern like a checkerboard versus a gray background. Um, and uh, the animals will show 50 50. They're not bothered about it. And then you give them the shocks and then you retest them on their preference. And all the animals show reduction in preference for the uh, for the for the one that they were um, given the shock with. Now, interestingly, what we saw was that the animals that showed the bias showed an increase in their fear responses. So they seem to be more fearful. Now, what was quite interesting about this is that what we were saying was that, OK, these animals are showing um, a laterality bias, but this can predict their behavior on a completely separate task. Now, what's quite nice about that is not only does it show that continuity of behavior in the zebrafish, which is good to see, but it also tells us a little bit about how this might be translationally relevant, because we know, for example, that humans that have 
um, laterality biases are more likely to get uh, anxiety and depression. So it may be that you get something similar in fish. For example, maybe they are more stress reactive or maybe they are more um, responsive to environmental stimuli, um, which is some sort of illustration of their personality type, uh, which can then be used to model, for example, human psychiatric disorders. OK, so before I finish and I am going to stick to time and I have one minute left, I just want to share with you before I uh, say my thanks and acknowledgements, um, some of the future directions. So at the moment, we're doing some Alzheimer's disease trials. So we're working with um, uh, patients with Alzheimer's disease to try to map some of the cognitive decline uh, in, uh, suffered by people with um uh, Alzheimer's. Um, I'm also working with colleagues at Southampton on the human version of the maze to understand some of the processes that are involved in navigation. So this is a, another version of the maze that we've developed. Um, so this is um, essentially where the person is in a cave and it actually is more like a Y. So um, we give people the chance to explore freely uh, and move around uh, within the Y maze. And we use different reinforcement contingencies. So either reward or punishment within that. Um, so either gaining money and losing money and so on for performance in order to understand the mechanisms that are underlying it. So there's lots of work that's currently going on. Um, also within this context, we can make the arms shorter or longer, which allow us to look into um, other aspects of kind of short term and long term memory. So um, just to summarise, the uh, FMPY maze is a, a fairly simple, non-invasive, uh, fully automated task of working memory. And not only is it easy to use in animals um, and it has strong interspecies relevance, it also has translational relevance to humans. Um, we know that performance within the Y maze involves working memory. And we also know that the neural circuits that underlie this performance are glutamatergic, cholinergic and dopaminergic in the same way as you would expect with human working memory. Um, the FMP Y maze has, in our view, the potential to look at a very broad range of uh, you know, neuropsychiatric, neurodegenerative conditions, um, also neurodevelopmental conditions. So, for example, repetitive behavior in autism is a potential uh, uh, way of using this. Um, and what's quite nice about this, I think, and really what makes it so useful is that we're able to capture quite subtle individual differences in performance on other tasks. And this allows us to be confident that this task tells us about underlying personality characteristics, which should be really useful for the uh, for the, the way that we use zebrafish um, as a translational model for human disease going forward. So um, just remains for me to thank uh, my wonderful team. Uh, I've mentioned uh, Madeline and Barbara before, my PhD students, uh, Nancy, who is my new PhD student, who's just started, and Faluso and Bidemi, who are all PhD students working in my lab. Also our fantastic technical staff, Jeff, Charlotte and Andy, um, but also my collaborators, especially Bill Budenberg, William Budenberg from Xantix, um, who has been good enough to help us with a lot of the development of our um, automated kit, uh, but also Michael Dardelli and Will Norton um, in Australia and in the UK, uh, but also to all of our fantastic funders who have made um, all of this research possible. Um, without them, it wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be happening. And thanks also to the conference organisers for asking me along today. And uh, I'd be very happy now to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much, Professor Parker. It was an amazing talk how much we can learn with this in this field so we have several questions from our audience i will start with uh, saeed shafi sabeh he said an interesting talk thanks to the presenter a question for him with zebrafish person personality or maybe sex may also increase variations in our observations for spontaneous alternation behavior um, so the the sex differences talk is a really interesting one. We published a paper. I didn't show the data today. We published a paper uh, last year, I think, or the year before, where we were looking at sex differences. And in fact, we don't see significant sex differences in y maze. So we don't see any uh, differences between males and females. We do see sex differences in various other uh, behavioural endpoints. So, for example, anxiety. We know that females show higher anxiety levels and so on. Um, but we don't see any increase in any of our y maze parameters in, in um, either males or females. In terms of personality, yeah, I mean, I think laterality is a, a good 
way of thinking about that. In, se in a sense, we, you know, we, we've seen that, that these laterality biases do impact on the um, Y-based performance. So I think there's good reasons to think that. Um, and also, you know, the, the fact that, that when we stress the animals out, um, that changes their performance as well. I think there's good reasons to think that that personality characteristics might be important. And actually, if I may, there's one other thing as well. We, we, we One of the reasons that we first started using the y maze that I didn't notice is that I didn't mention is because we, we carry out a lot of more, you know, like learning experiments. So we carry out, for example, um, impulsivity tests, which can take weeks and weeks and weeks to run. One of the reasons that we like the Y maze is because animals that don't perform in that Y maze, so animals that don't show normal responses, may well also not perform well in other learning tasks. So although we haven't looked at this systematically, I think it's a really interesting empirical question is looking at how performance in the Y maze would then impact on their performance on other tasks. So to answer the question, there are no sex differences that we've seen and we've tested a lot of animals. Um, but there are very, very likely to be personality differences. Um, but again, it's an empirical question. So I think we need to determine what those personality differences are and then test it. Okay. And have you used any specific line? Uh, yeah, we've tested. Well, I mean, yeah, we've tested it in, in uh, uh, the uh, AB line, but also in our um, some of our genetic lines. So we have uh, there's not time to go into all of it now, but we, we, we do a lot of work on, for example, um, attention deficit disorder and so on. And we see some differences in in that in terms of repetitions. Uh, we also do some work in um, some neurodevelopmental disorders like uh, muscular dystrophy. Uh, and actually, we don't see any differences in in that. But it, it, it's we, we've been doing some work with um, I mentioned uh, Michael Lardelli, who's one of my collaborators from Australia. Um, we've been doing some work in uh, early onset Alzheimer's um, and looking at whether you get differences in performance for uh, lines that have uh, genetic uh, mutations that are linked to Alzheimer's disease. And um, so far, the, the uh, results seem to suggest that there are some differences uh, within those lines as well. So we, we do see lines genetically. Um, I just haven't presented any of the data today. Thank you. Renata, are you going to ask? Oh, okay. Uh, the next question is also from Said. Um, maybe not relevant to the topic. How about potential impacts of personality on their color preferences using the T maze model? Any expectations? Uh I don't know <laughs> would be the answer to that. Um, I mean, I know that there, you know, there has been research done on that before, but that's not something that we've really looked at. So um, I, I, I wouldn't like to speculate until we've done the research. Do, do the experiment, Saeed, I would say. Great. Uh, the next question is from, sorry for the pronunciation, Aline, Aline Bashi Zadeh. Uh, Question for Professor Parker. How zebrafish would remember own choice without unconditioned stimulus? Uh, what? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question without unconditioned stimulus. Okay, um, I, I think I understand the question. So we, 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 one of the reasons we use this test is because we wanted to have something that didn't have uh, you know, specific, you know, reinforcement contingencies or, you know, Pavlovian contingencies associated with it. We wanted to have a test whereby um, the animal is swimming around freely and is able to make choices based on no uh, underlying preference. So, you know, for example, if we wanted to, I don't know, introduce negative reinforcement, it could be that when the animal entered one of the arms, it had a shock or something like that. But very specifically, we didn't want to do that because we wanted to look whether there are natural search patterns with the animals. Now, if if the animal is using alternations and if it's changing over time, then the memory is very straightforwardly just a motor trace, right? So it went left last time, it went right next time. So it doesn't it doesn't rely on some sort of reference memory necessarily all it is is a simple motor memory last time i went this one now i go this way and we don't really know why they do it 
we know that humans do it now. We know that mice do it and we know that fish do it. Um, and as I mentioned at the end of the talk, one of the things we're interested in doing in the future or at the moment is looking into uh, some of the mechanisms that might underlie it in terms of what happens if you introduce positive and negative reinforcement or, or punishment within that. So I think if I understood the question correctly, which I may not have done, um, what, what you were saying was, you know, if you're not using conditioning, how can you say it's memory? Well, I would ask the question back, if it's not memory, why are the animals turning left and then right and then left and then right why is it not random yeah so i mean that 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 would be my that would be my response is what what else is it if someone could give me an alternative explanation i'd, I'd, I'd like to hear it as well because we can't think of any other reason why that might be great uh, the next question is from isabella uh, guermandi uh, dr matt do you think exercise voluntary and intense could influence memorization at older ages in zebrafish. How do you classify an old fish in terms of behavior and cognition? That, that's a really, really good question. Actually, some of the stuff that we've been looking at. So the exercise one is a really interesting question. And actually, one of the things we looked at within our aging paper, and Isabella, if you're interested, you should check it out. It's in um, uh, Neurobiology of Aging Journal. I think it's open access, so you can go ahead and have a look at it. Um, we looked at oxygen consumption because we were interested to know whether there were any metabolic changes within the older animals that might have predicted differences in their performance. And we did actually see some differences, and that's led to um, – some potential work that I'd like to do in the future, which is looking at, for example, metabolic differences in aging uh, and, uh, you know, nutritional differences and so on. Can you put the question back up? Because it was a second part and I've forgotten it. Sorry, it was there and it disappeared. <laughs> yeah, just a second. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jairo, você poderia colocar de novo a pergunta na tela que o professor está pedindo? Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, just that's perfect. Um, yeah. So so yeah, exercise is definitely a really interesting one. And I say we're looking at that in the future. And that, that's a really interesting idea in terms of how you classify an old fish. Yeah. I mean, it's difficult. So we basically we we did we grew the fish up to two years old, which um, in the literature is what other people have done. Actually, they will live a lot longer than that. And we've been testing them at older ages as well. We see similar, um, and, you know, the decline carries on. But the reason we use two years is because obviously part of what we're trying to do is is look at whether you see aging related cognitive decline. So the fact that we see it, um, you know, quite clearly in animals that are over the age of two um, and you do start to see, you know, physical changes at that age as well, which would be associated with aging. Um, so uh, that's kind of how we came up with it. But it's a bit of a circular problem. I get that. Um, I think the fact that's one of the reasons why we were quite happy when we saw the differences in humans at 70. And look, 70 isn't really that old now. You know, I mean, it's uh, it's 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 older, but it's not old, old. Um, and again, we see in older fish still. So we've had fish at three years old and more that also show similar cognitive changes. Um, and uh, in humans, we're looking at humans with Alzheimer's at the moment as well. So that, the, both really, really good questions. So thanks for that. Thank you. And she's asking, um, how differences between fish and mammals in the formation of nervous system interfere in memory and learning? For instance, the homologous region of the hippocampus is located externally in fish. Um, I, I don't know really whether the, I mean, you know, obviously the, the neural circuits and the homologous brain regions are two separate questions because obviously the way that the brain is um, organized anatomically um, and the way that those neural circuits project are two separate questions. So if you're asking whether the, um, the brain regions would make a difference, um, maybe, but I, I guess we see the same patterns of behavior in both animals. So I don't know what difference that would be in terms of the neural circuits there's been a lot of work that has mapped out you know the uh, ascending tracks so dopaminergic you know cholinergic and serotonergic and so on um, within the zebrafish brain and compared that to the mammalian brain and although there's topographical differences in terms of where the brain regions are you still see similar kinds of tracks um, with you know um, the, the sort of uh, the initial ganglia or wherever that, that they start from and and, uh, uh, and and the end points being in regions that we can then assume are similar in function to what you see in the mammals. Um, in terms of um, how that might interfere with memory, I don't know how to answer that really because obviously we, we see very similar patterns in the fish to what we see in the mammals. It's possible that that might be why we see increases in repetitions. 
Um, I didn't talk about this in the talk, but my my gut feeling actually with that is that it's because the fish are maybe a little bit more stress sensitive. And as I mentioned before, you see stress increases repetition. So it may be that that's why we see um, a bit more repetitions in fish than we do in the in the mammals and the humans. But again, these are all things we're testing at the moment. We're going to be testing stress, acute stress responses in humans. Um, and we've also seen uh, similarities in the mice in terms of Alzheimer's models in mice where they show huge performance deficits. So I guess in answer to your question at the moment, um, I don't think it really makes any difference because we are seeing the same behavioural patterns. So if there are differences, it seems that through processes of, processes of convergent evolution, um, those neural circuits have, uh, have, have kind of dealt with that problem and overcome it. Thank you. We still have some questions. Um, Moyeni uh, Ifelua, sorry for the pronunciation. Um, thank you, Dr. Matt, for your presentation. In chemical exposure, if Shaolin behavior of zebrafish is altered, will, will that change the level of dopamine or is it the other way around? Uh, in chemical exposure, in Shaolin. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know really how to answer that. Um, the, I, I suppose if you're, if you expose it, if you expose an animal to a dopamine agonist, it might change their. If you expose a fish to dopamine agonist, it might increase their, I don't know, their their sort of preference for shoal mates, which might in, increase it. Um, uh, and also dopamine being, you know, released um, endogenously during kind of social interaction, you may also see increases in dopamine in that sense. So um, I'm not entirely sure I know how to answer that question, but I think it could work either way. So I think giving an increase in dopamine could increase shoaling. And also you might expect to see an increase in dopamine during shoaling. So it could be either way. Thank you. Now, Angelo Piato is, ask, is saying, congratulations on the lecture. Uh, couldn't the results observed in, the, in elderly animals be caused by a motor impairment related to aging? Um, I, I suppose it could be theoretically, although we don't really see very big changes in motor activity. That's one of the reasons why we looked at um, metabolic differences as well. Um, but the, 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 it could be to do with the motor impairment. But actually, although this, the number of turns was slightly fewer, um, it wasn't enough to make us think that. So, for example, in the older, in the younger animals, um, you know, a lot of them will make about a thousand turns. In the older animals, maybe it went to you know, sort of six or 700, um, they do move a little bit slower. Um, but it didn't seem to make a huge difference in terms of when we give them the, the dopamine agonist, for example, um, that actually decreases the number of turns they make, older and younger animals, and increases the number of alternations. So it's it's possible. We did think about that. Um, I should also mention we, we always control for the number of turns as a covariate in our statistical analyses. So it Although it's possible, we don't think that's the underlying. Um, we don't think that's the underlying factor. But yeah, it's a good question. Wait, we still have uh, many questions. If you don't mind to answer them, we uh, yeah, we move another forward. Few, another few okay, minutes. Yeah, we, can we have on. around four questions still. Sure, sure. Is Isabella uh, Gemondi again? How does making choices? I maze interfere in the construction of other learning processes, such as spatial learning. Can clues from the environment influence the animal's decisions after learning? Yeah, that's that's another great question. Isabella is asking some very good questions. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, these are all questions, actually, that we're, that we're kind of looking at, really. So um, in terms of other learning processes, yeah, I mean, we don't, one of the things we, we're interested in looking at, um, I mentioned during the talk that we... Um, we've looked at, uh, we, we do the maze in the dark, right? So one of the things we're looking at, or we're going to be looking at soon, is what happens uh, in different lighting conditions and also whether you have cues within the maze. So whether you have, uh, for example, local cues or more distal cues that might change the way the animals navigate. Um, the other way we're going to look at it is in terms of reinforcement. I mentioned before where, uh, for example, you reinforce entries to certain arms and not to the others. So I think really, um, in answer to your question, Isabella, um, th these are all really interesting questions and something we don't really know yet. And I think when we understand that more, it will help us to understand more about what those underlying processes are, you know, how this works in terms of spatial navigation. At the moment, you know, for me, this is a, 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 
essentially not really to do with spatial navigation. It's to do with motor feedback. You know, it's like um, it, it's almost like a sort of reflex. It's like left, right, left, right. This is something that they naturally do when they're just searching around an environment that doesn't really have any inherent value to making a particular choice. So we need to understand more about what happens when we change the value of those choices um, and how that impacts on behavior. But that, yeah, really good questions. Great. Uh, we have a question from Argentina. Veronica Lombardo, great talk. Did you know if the behavior could change depending on the time day as consequence of circadian clock? Oh, that's, that's another good question. Well, that's a good question here. Yeah, I mean, we, we control for the time of day um, that we do it for that very reason. We don't really know. Um, the, you know, these are experiments that would be nice to do, actually, to look at whether you get differences in circadian rhythm. One of the problems is, of course, with our in our zebrafish facility is that obviously, you know, um, it, it's based around feeding times and so on and light on and light off. Um, so, uh, you know, ideally, it would be done in a situation where that didn't influence. Um, my feeling is that you probably will see circadian rhythm differences. Um, I think the fact that you um you know that the animals are more active in the morning for example and that there are different processes involved in the morning than perhaps in the evening um you know in terms of foraging in terms of um you know reproductive behavior and so on i think there's a very good chance that you will see differences um i don't know what those differences are yet um, because as i've said so far we don't necessarily see large influences uh, hormonally so in terms of you know sex differences and so on so i don't know what those differences will be but it's a really interesting thing to look at but also you know i i'd rather look at that when we know a little bit more about what the animals are doing in that environment because at the moment you know we know it's memory to some extent because we can block it with memory drugs right but we don't know really you know what the underlying processes are in terms of the cognitive uh you know cognitive processes so when we know that then it gives us a more sort of a nicer framework for those kinds of experiments i think thank you now we have a question you have a spoiler from the two other questions but uh now it's professor chung de xiao he gave a talk in our webinar last week yeah uh, he said uh matt good talk do you compare y maze data with t maze for short-term memory any consistency uh, yeah, no, we, we haven't done that, actually. <laughs> so this is another reason. So I've, I've done some work with the T-Maze in the past. So I published a couple of couple of papers years ago using T-Mazes for zebrafish. Um, you know, one of the things that influenced this was, um, was T-Maze behavior in rodents. So there was some work done uh, looking at, um, you know, uh, um, consecutive two choice discriminations in rodents where you have equally reinforced alternatives in the T-maze. So if you imagine you have a T-maze um, with uh, two arms that were equally reinforced, 50% on either side, the animal can choose one of those arms and then it can re-enter the maze and start the whole process again. When you have equal reinforcement on the arms, um, what you find is that the animals perform more alternations, sort of like like exactly like we've shown. Um, I don't have a graph here, but I could show you a graph from a T-maze paper with mice where they show identical responses to what we see with the, with the up and down. Um, I've also just, I was just... Uh, doing a viva for a phd yesterday actually uh where they were using animal sheep you know uh looking at sheep two choice discriminations for looking at alzheimer's disease uh, and actually they see very similar patterns again you get these alternations and this was on a two screens so the animal had to choose between uh images that came up on two screens and again you see this alternation type behavior with that so my feeling is that you you see this kind of behavior um in any kind of scenario T maze where, where you have two choices where the animal re, you know has to make a choice between two things now again as i've said to isabella who keeps asking me questions uh yeah you know it may well be that if you have uh different reinforcement contingencies so if you reinforce one more than the other you'll remove that but i think in a in an equal scenario where you have no difference in reinforcer weighting or choice weighting probability or anything else that's when you get the alternation start to appear hey and our last question of the day, uh, Veronica Lombardo, again, uh, she's, she said, very interesting talk in the FMP Y maze essay. Sorry, my, my pronunciation. That's fine. Uh, did you have in mind the size of fish for the distance of the way, particularly when it's compared uh, fish of 
six months yeah. to two years old. <clears throat> yeah, no, I, 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 yeah, that's you're right. We, we, we have got different sizes um, for the Y maze. We don't have a different ones for the six months to two years old because they weren't, ma you know, too much different. They were slightly different, um, but not too much different. But our maze is um, big enough so that the six month olds um, can fit in it quite, quite comfortably. Um, but we also have smaller mazes um, that go through the age. So we try to match the size of the maze to the age of the fish. Um, so we do have a variety of different sizes that we use. And actually, you know, again, good question, because one of the things we're looking at at the moment um, with our suppliers is coming up with different sizes of arms um, so that we can look at because, uh, you know, another thing that one would predict if we're looking at memory, of course, is that if you made the arms longer. And the distance between the and the, the, the you know the, the the time difference between the choices longer, you would predict that that would impact on memory. So it's a very simple question, uh, but it's something that we want to study, and that's part of what we're doing with humans. It's uh, so again, looking at the size of the maze is something that we're quite aware of, and something we've been looking at um, certainly with our ontogeny work. But but yeah, it does make a difference, um, especially like you say with with you know the two and the six month old, it can make quite a big difference. So yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Matt Parker. It was a great talk, a very interesting discussion. And thank you for all the information. We learned a lot. I guess this system shows how, how many different uh, other researches and, and, and works can be done with this system. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, thank you. So we then uh, are approaching the last uh, the final stage of our webinar we would like to thank i would like to call back to our room uh, professor rafael okay okay thank you very much um so i will uh, uh, share my screen with you yes so we are reaching the end of our webinar we hope you all enjoy it. We would like to thank our organizing committee members that without them, nothing could be possible. So thank you, Mayra, Isabella, Larissa, Felipe, Carol, Renata, Bianca, and Luis Henrique. And I also, I, I want to, to give my special thanks to our technical staff uh, from AGDC. So Renato Grassi, Renato Souza, Jairo, and Sergio. Uh, they were fantastic. Uh, they they work really hard to to make the YouTube transmission well done and uh, and perfectly. So my special thanks uh, for them. Uh, and I also I want to thank the our institutes that support our event, Institute of uh, Institute of Bioscience here in São Paulo State University in Botucatu. Institute of Biomedical Science uh, in São Paulo, uh, University of São Paulo, Federal University of uh, Rio de Janeiro, and Osvaldo Cruz Foundation, Fio Cruz Rio. And I also want to thank uh, all of our sponsors that also supported uh, the, this event. And of course, we would like to thank, a big thank, to all of the 100, uh, 1,300 subscribers from different parts of the world that have been connected with us in this webinar and made this event possible. Just uh, for information, until now we have 1,323 uh, views in the YouTube uh, channel. So thank you very much. A warm thank for all subscribers that believed in this event. So I hope we have a second edition uh, of this uh, webinar. So I also would like to thank again and again, our excellent and brilliant speakers from all over the world that brought amazing advances in science using zebrafish. So thank you so much for being uh, with us uh, in this webinar. So I now, uh, Thank you, Rafael. I would like to thank as well Evie Silva, who was also one of the coordinators of our uh, webinar. Unfortunately, 
could not be here today. But I would like to thank him as well. Uh, these 4,300 views were amazing during this webinar. And if you are interested, uh, we are organizing a research topic entitled Animal Models for Pharmacological Investigation of Treatments and Diagnostics for Diseases. It is in Frontiers in Cell and Developmental Biology Journal. We invite you to submit your research manuscript related to your uh, zebrafish research. Uh, moreover, we would like to remind you that all certificates will be sent through your email address after filling the form available at the link in this chat. If you do not receive your certificate after two weeks, please contact us by the following email, webinarzebrafish at gmail.com. Thank you very much. Thank you all for the particip participation. Follow us, follow us on social media for new events and updates. See you on our next webinar. See you all. I hope Thank you very all. much. Thank See you very all. much for all. Thank you. Trabalhamos diariamente para criar soluções e equipamentos para a comunidade científica, contribuindo com o avanço da pesquisa biomédica latino-americana. Nossa missão é maior do que somente fornecer equipamentos, é proporcionar segurança com atendimento de qualidade e, principalmente, com muito respeito e atenção. Por isso, investimos em alta tecnologia e buscamos manter relacionamentos duradouros. Nosso compromisso é ser um parceiro confiável que compreenda as necessidades, a realidade e as condições de cada cliente para assim oferecer a melhor solução sempre. Entendemos os benefícios da pesquisa científica para a humanidade e isso nos estimula. Se hoje temos melhor qualidade de vida, maior longevidade, se vencemos um câncer ou fazemos uso de um remédio para dor de cabeça, é porque o avanço da pesquisa biomédica nos permite. Confiamos no trabalho dos pesquisadores, na ciência e na comunidade científica. E nos orgulhamos em fazer a nossa parte. Assim como você, somos apaixonados. Ciência é o que nos move. Porque para Alesco, pesquisa é para a vida.